what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined by Jim Sinus of FanDuel, who's here to continue helping us break down Week 9 from a DFS perspective. Jim, what's happening? It's all good, Greg. The value plays this week, kind of scary in accordance with Halloween. So I guess there is that. Uh, unfortunately, the NFL following that theme, and there are some frightening options in the value section for this week. We got to find value somewhere. So I guess we got to talk through them. I'm a little frightened. How are you doing? To be honest with you, a little disappointed because I woke up to an email from you saying, all right, my quarterback this week that's undervalued is Mitchell Trubisky. And I'm like, dude, what happened to Derek Carr? Well, Derek Carr is the same salary as Sam Darnold. I prefer Sam Darnold straight up, uh, so I would probably wind up going there anyway, and he's $200 less than Jameis Winston. So if we're going to go value, let's dive all the way into that dumpster, bathe in the slush, and go with Trubisky instead. Fine, we're, we're bathing in, in something. I don't know if we want to call it slush or mud or just a poop at this point, but you're going to Mitchell Trubisky. Why? I'd rather not, to be fully honest, uh, but we are talking about value plays here, so I try to keep it to quarterbacks under $7,000, and there's not a lo whole lot cooking there this week. We do have Mason Rudolph at 68, Matt Moore is in play at 65 if Pat Mahomes can't go, but Trubisky, there are a couple of factors that make him intriguing. The first one is that he should be passing a bit more this week against his Eagles defense because they grade out as being sixth against the rush based on number of fires metrics compared to being 21st against the pass. So he should be passing a bit more often and may be able to do so a bit more efficiently than usual. And also last week, Trubisky did set a new season high in rush attempts. It was four, which is much lower than what he did last year. But it, I think that if you're Matt Nagy, you're trying to kickstart this offense. That could mean more David Montgomery, but it could also mean more Mitchell Trubisky, getting back to what made you successful last year. Maybe Trubisky's not healthy enough for that, but if he's healthy, I see no reason why they wouldn't continue to increase the ground game as being a presence within Trubisky's game. So... I think we could see things get better from that perspective. Uh, so I think that looking at this spot, it's tough. And I'd rather spend four guys like Sam Darnold at 73, Phillip Rivers at 72. Uh, we've also got Jameis Winston again at 75. But if you want to get Dalvin Cook and Christian McCaffrey in your lineup, you got to spend down. And I think that Trubisky is at least an option. Again, I think that Rudolph and Matt Moore are as well. So if you'd rather go there, I don't blame you. That's totally okay. But I think that there are at least some reasons to consider Trubisky this weekend, despite how wretched he has been for the full year. I get needing to save money going after a Christian McCaffrey. He's almost $10,000 this week. Mitchell Trubisky, even against Philadelphia, as you started off, I'd rather not. <laughs> Let's move on to the running backs here, Jim. And someone that I am more interested in is the former Chicago Bears, Jordan Howard. Miles Sanders is banged up. You got the all-important revenge game for Howard. And perhaps most importantly, he looked good last week. And the Chicago rush defense, ever since this team lost to Keem Hicks, hasn't been nearly as frightful. Why else do you like Jordan Howard this week? It's mostly the reasons that you mentioned. Obviously, the revenge game, chiefly among them, because, you know, what other process do we need here? But I think that I agree with your assessment of the Eagles last week. Part of the reason they ran so much last week was because the weather was terrible, and that certainly factors in here, but they were also just moving dudes. This is a talented offensive line. It's among the best in football, and when you're getting heavy rushing volume behind them, it's probably going to be fairly efficient. We've seen running backs be efficient against Chicago ever since Akeem Hicks first got banged up. Uh, uh, back in earlier this season, we've seen running backs do pretty well against them. Latavius Murray did well in this uh, facing this defense. So I don't think it's totally outrageous to view this as being a plus spot now for opposing backs. And Jordan Howard could get volume. It's not just Miles Sanders who is banged up. Darren Sproles has missed the past couple of games. He was able to practice Wednesday. So Sproles may be back. But if we get this situation where either Sanders or Sproles is out, I think we're going to see pretty good volume for Jordan Howard. And as mentioned, it is an air revenge game. He's had at least 11 carries in seven straight games. So he was getting volume even before the injuries to Sanders and Darren Sproles. And again, I think that attaching ourselves to talented offensive lines and good quarterbacks is good process at running back. Howard does get some work in the passing game too. It's not a whole lot, but it's enough. So I think that this does make sense for Jordan Howard if both Sanders and Sproles are healthy. It would definitely lower my thought process and lower the appeal behind Jordan Howard. But if one of them does wind up sitting, I think that he is a viable revenge game narrative play at $6,300.
It's a really solid play at that price. As you mentioned, the whole important revenge game is what stands out. There's a whole lot of other reasons to really like Jordan Howard this week, especially at that price at $6,300. It may be uh, not as fun to do it because he's an old veteran and it feels like he's been around forever, but Jordan Howard's still young enough to perform really, really well, potentially this Sunday against Chicago. Another running back that you like, and you've been all over this one, Jim, this week, it's Melvin Gordon. For the Los Angeles Chargers, they're home against Green Bay. Gordon is also $6,300 on FanDuel here this week. But Melvin Gordon, the whole talk about him in the fantasy Twitter universe has been the plotting under three yards per carry. And it hasn't looked good. It hasn't felt good. Why are you holding your nose and putting in Melvin Gordon this week? Yeah, I think you can make a strong case for either Melvin Gordon or Austin Eckler this week because the Chargers fired their offensive coordinator, Ken Wisenhunt, which means that we're probably going to see some sort of change in their personnel or usage, and that could benefit Austin Eckler at $6,500, or it could benefit Melvin Gordon at 63 So I think that from a tournament perspective, both these guys are at least options if you assume that one of them winds up getting more volume under the new play caller for the Chargers. The reason that Melvin Gordon has been so hideously inefficient is partly because his offensive line is super banged up, but it's also because of the matchups they've had. In the past three games, the Chargers have faced the teams ranked second, fifth, and ninth against the rush based on number fire schedule adjusted metrics. The Packers, as we've talked about a couple of times this year, are not that. They were actually ranked 26th against the rush, partly by design. Uh, Mike Patton wanting to force teams to run against him rather than pass. I understand that. It makes a lot of sense, but it means we should see a more efficient Melvin Gordon in this game. He's been playing... You know, a pretty good number of snaps. He's been getting some work in the passing game. He's been getting a good number of, of carries as well. So I think that we could see a kind of resurgent week for Melvin Gordon. He is not a bad running back. He's just had a bad situation behind this offensive line. Austin Eckler's efficiency as a rusher has gone down too ever since Mike Pouncey got hurt. So it, it makes sense that this guy has struggled, but he gets a better matchup. He is... I guess in in name only at home, uh, but it can't hurt to be there rather than on the road. So I think that Melvin Gordon makes sense. Again, I think that Austin Eckler does too at 65, depending on who you think will wind up getting a slight role change here under the new OC. I'd probably favor Melvin Gordon given the tendencies they have shown so far this year, but I think it does make sense to give some thought to Eckler too at $6,500. I'm really interested to see what this Chargers offense looks like with a new offensive coordinator, with Anthony Lynn taking a more active approach in running the offense. You know he wants to run the ball. That was his mantra as a running backs coach previously and then as an interim head coach with the Buffalo Bills. And he's been Melvin Gordon's biggest believer. Of course, if you just watch the tape or, or watch the game, you know that's not a great approach to take, but that's what the coach is going to do. So we need to listen to the coach for once and play Melvin Gordon, whether we like it or not. Moving on to the wide receiver here, Jim. We'll get to Marvin Jones of the Detroit Lions. I believe yesterday we talked about Kenny Galladay, so talking about Marvin Jones today kind of makes sense because I know you like both of them this week. Yeah, and I don't hate Danny Amendola either at $6,000. He's a little bit spendy, and he doesn't get as many high leverage targets as these guys. But I think, honestly, all three Detroit Lions wide receivers are in play because the Raiders are that bad against the pass. And Matthew Stafford has been that good this year. So it kind of makes sense to take stabs at all of them. I would rank them Galladay, Jones, and Amendola, but I think that they're all in play. The reason I like... Marvin Jones is a value play is that unlike Amendola, he is getting more higher leverage targets. He has 19% of the team's targets in the four games where Amendola has played at least half the snaps, which is not a big number, but it comes with a good amount of high leverage work. He is averaging 1.5 deep targets per game in those four games and 1.5 red zone targets per game. So he's a good threat to score a touchdown. He can also haul in a long ball or two, and that can allow a guy at $5,700 to pay off pretty quickly. So I think that it does make sense to go to Marvin Jones here. Again, I'm going to rank him below Kenny Galladay, even when you consider that Galladay is a much more expensive guy, given how much deep work Kenny Galladay has gotten. And Marvin Jones does get a downgrade, with Danny Amendola being a relevant piece within this offense. But even with that being the case, Amendola played more than half the snaps in that game where Jones went off back in week seven. He can still have a huge game. So Marvin Jones, not my preferred piece of this Lions passing game, but he will be a guy I turn to pretty often in tournaments this week at $5,700. And I think this entire passing game, just kind of light him up and see what happens against this Raiders defense. It's not only you that likes Danny Amendola this week. A lot of smart fantasy players who I trust really like Amendola. Marvin Jones as well. They're firing up this Lions offense, especially with the lack of running game they now have with Carrion Johnson out for the year. Good spot to put in a wide receiver from Detroit into your lineup. 
One more wide receiver we want to get to, and that brings us to Mike Williams with the Chargers. We go back to this game, and this touchdown positive regression, it has to be coming. Right, Jim? I hope. I've been waiting for it for a while now, and it hasn't come yet, but I think that with Mike Williams, it should get there. And the reason we should like Mike Williams is kind of similar to Marvin Jones, because he gets a hot, a lot of high-leverage targets. We can look at the three games since Hunter Henry came back, and yeah, it does add an additional piece to this passing game, but Mike Williams has still gotten really good volume in that time. He has 20% of the Chargers' overall targets in this three-game sample. He has 25% of their deep targets and 21% of the red zone targets. Now, 25% of the deep targets is not a huge number, but Philip Rivers has been very willing to throw deep in this time. So the raw volume down the field has been very good for Mike Williams. Just happens to come in an offense that does that quite a bit, which deflates the shares of those deep targets. But we know that he can catch a long ball and the yardage totals have been there despite some pretty tough matchups this year. Now, the Green Bay Packers have a good secondary and they're not exactly the easiest matchup. But when you have as many good pieces as the, as the Chargers have, I would expect them to move the ball against this Packers team as we've seen teams uh, that have good players, multiple good players do throughout this season. I think that applies to the Chargers here. And Mike Williams is the cheapest piece between Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry and Mike Williams. So I'm going to plug him in. Eventually, the touchdowns will come. That body is made for the red zone. Ten touchdowns last year. He did overperform there but he's underperforming this year. So the regression will come in a positive sense now for Mike Williams. And I think we're going to keep on plugging him in as long as he is this cheap. We'll just keep putting him in there. The touchdowns are coming. So we believe they have to. Philip Rivers now has a mustache. So it seems like a lock this weekend. Mike Williams, get him in the lineup here against the Green Bay Packers at under $6,000. One last player to speak about, Jim, and it's at the tight end position. It's Greg Olson against Tennessee. It's... Not been a great year for Olsen. He is priced at just $5,300. But why do you like him here on Sunday against the Titans? Yeah, I'm guessing a lot of the attention in this game will go to Jonu Smith because it looks like Delaney Walker may wind up sitting in. And Jonu Smith is a very athletically gifted guy. He is super fast. He has shown that he is good. But I don't trust his offense as much as I trust Greg Olson's, especially when Jonu Smith is pretty likely to be a popular option for this week. So I don't mind pivoting over to Greg Olson because Greg Olson is still playing 78% of the snaps uh, he did last week for this Panthers offense against the 49ers. But he was on a bye. He was in London. Uh, and then he played the 49ers. So we haven't really seen Greg Olson on a main slate, a relevant main slate, in quite some time. That has pushed his salary down to $5,300. And that's justified given the struggles he has had with Kyle Allen as his quarterback, but he has the potential to have a really good game here. He has had at least seven targets twice in the games that Kyle Allen has started. He got three deep looks in one of those. We know he can get some work in the red zone. Curtis Samuel is banged up for the Panthers. He missed practice on Wednesday with a shoulder injury, and if he can't go, that's going to give additional targets to Greg Olson and to your boy DJ Moore, but I think that Olson's kind of in play even if Samuel does go just because he's a pretty solid pivot off of Jonu Smith. I will still use Jonu Smith in tournaments because he does have good yardage upside, which is hard to find for a tight end in the salary tier, but it's also okay to trust the better offense, that is the Carolina Panthers, and trust the more experienced player in Greg Olson. So for $5,300, I don't think he is a bad play, even though I understand why Jonu Smith will be popular this weekend. After what he did last week with Ryan Tannehill, quarterback, Johnny Smith, going to be very, very popular in the DFS community. Greg Olson, a fine pivot. Tight end position is so hard, and you're just banging on that touchdown. Olson at $5,300, certainly someone to consider. Jason Witten as well. He always kills the Giants, so you should put him in there as well. That's going to do it for us here on the Fan Duel. Hurry up, Jim. Best of luck this weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. Good luck to you as well. Happy Halloween, and we'll see you then. Absolutely. Happy Halloween to you. Tomorrow, Gabe Morency joins me, and we go over his six best bets for Week 9 of this NFL season. Have a great night. Enjoy Thursday Night Football, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow.